Sharecropping was a system in which blacks would be granted land and in exchange would have to give a portion of their produce to the white landowner. This system resembled medieval feudalism, a system where the rich landowners imposed tribute on poor farmers who farmed their land. Sharecropping began when General Grant T. Sherman issued Field Order No. 15, giving each family of refugee slaves following his army 40 acres as well as spare mules, leading many free blacks to seek the promise of 40 acres and a mule. In 1865, this hope of self-sustenance and self-reliance was stamped out when President Andrew Johnson ordered that all land be returned to its former pre-war owners. Blacks had to sign a labor contract with the landowners or be evicted by federal troops. In 1870, 30,000 African Americans owned land, while 4 million did not. It was very hard for blacks to prosper economically, being so dependent on white landowners or landlords. It has been found that the number of lynchings in an area depended on how economically prosperous the black residents were. If a black man became an economic competitor with whites, or even richer than whites, they risked being lynched. In conclusion, the limitation of black economic mobility was the first step in the erosion of black freedoms in the post-Civil War South. So the plantation system, in a smaller and modified way, continued and can be found in the South today. Jim Crow law started with the Plessy v. Ferguson court case ruling separate but equal. Homer Plessy was seven-eighths white and one-eighth African-American. For most states, he passed for white, but for the state of Louisiana, he was considered an African-American. On June 7, 1892, Plessy purposely sat in the whites-only streetcar and identified himself as black. He was arrested and his case was taken to the Supreme Court. He argued that this was a violation of the 13th and 14th Amendment in the Constitution. The Supreme Court stated that it wasn't, and separate but equal was indeed legal. Since then, whites separated from blacks in every way and Jim Crow laws came into full action. It was already in place from the 1870s, but after the Supreme Court ruling, whites escalated this tactic quickly. The name Jim Crow came from a black character that was very offensive to black culture and a minstrel show. It was heavily demonstrated in the southern parts of the United States where slaves were predominant before the end of the Civil War. Some examples of Jim Crow laws were separate public facilities like schools, buses, diners, restaurants, fountains, railroads, laundromats, libraries, interracial marriage was illegal, etc. The problem with segregation was that it was equal, but it didn't demonstrate equity. African Americans did everything they could to get segregation illegal and integration legal. They organized peace protests such as sit-ins, freedom rides, and marches. After the Brown v. Board of Education ruling, segregation became illegal in public schools. The situation with the Little Rock Nine students in Arkansas caused President Eisenhower to demand schools to be integrated immediately. In, in 1964, Jim Crow laws and any other form of segregation were declared illegal via the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The KKK wear iconic costumes that signify their push for white supremacy. They consist of floor-length solid white robes and a white pointed hat that includes a full face mask with two eye holes. The KKK was founded in Poliski, Tennessee by six Confederate veterans in 1866. The KKK was formed to reestablish white supremacy in America. In the beginning, most of the violent campaigns were geared towards white and black Republican leaders. It was more like a fraternity than a terrorist group. However, the KKK soon spread to every state in the South and became an intimidating force in their community. The reestablishment of white supremacy was their main goal. The KKK was saw their numbers rise during the 1870s due to Democratic due to Democrats recontrolling Congress. Their main political opponents were Republicans who were ruining their way of life during the Reconstruction period. In the South, lynchings helped maintain white supremacy in the economic, political spheres of America. Lynchings in the Deep South was a commonplace. There were huge public events and were often advertised in newspapers. Another common practice was collecting souvenirs from the dead bodies of the lynch. Mainly body parts were taken and put on display. During the late 19th century and early 20th century, nearly two to three African Americans were lynched a week. From the 1800s to, the 19, to 1955, 
5,000 African Americans were lynched. Sadly, three-fourths of all victims of lynchings were political activists, labor organizers, and people who failed to meet white expectations. One-fourth of the victims were accused of rape. The reason for the high number of lynchings of, on political activists were to kill off opponents who would bring change. The white community wanted to keep their way of life and keep the Af African American community down at the bottom. Nearly 50 years after the Civil War, 1910, hundreds of thousands of blacks migrated up to the northern cities as well as the west. Why were blacks suddenly migrating? In 1913, to 1915, a drop in cotton prices brought an economic depression in the South. In 1915, a series of natural occurrences such as floods destroyed homes and farms along the Mississippi River, bordering the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, which were most oftentimes owned by blacks. Insects destroyed many crops which blacks worked on. Also, the implementation of the Jim Crow laws segregated most, if not all, of the South's livelihoods. What were some pull factors? Slavery was not as eminent in the North. Northern factories were flourishing during the war involving the U.S. and the Europe, and the salaries were much higher in the North. Booker T. Washington was born a slave in a Virginia farmhouse on April 5th of 1856. As a young boy, he took great interest in education. He traveled hundreds of miles on foot to get an education from Hampton Institute. Washington excelled in his studies and was recognized by his headmaster, Samuel C. Armstrong, who offered him a scholarship. Armstrong was later in charge of finding a white man to run the new Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, later known as Tuskegee University in Alabama but later chose Washington. After his appointment, Washington traveled along the Virginia countrysides promoting his school and reassuring whites that his school would not threaten white supremacy. Instead, he taught his colleagues that patients would become them and that if African Americans remained financially independent and advanced in their own culture, that soon enough they would gain economic and political rights and eventually gain the respect and acceptance from the whites. Washington's passive insight on equality started controversy within the black community, oftentimes stating that he was not fighting for African Americans' equality. While some African Americans praised Washington, others, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, saw him as a traitor. By 1913, Washington's influence dwindled down as the newly inaugurated Wilson administration was cool to the idea of racial integration and equality. Although Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois had different views on the civil rights, the important thing is they tried to do what they thought was best for the black people in America. They both were working towards the goal of equal rights, but Booker's way was going to take more time and so people took towards W.E.B. Du Bois, because if he could make it happen, his change would come much quicker. Although they were both working on towards the same goal, they remained rivals until Booker's death 